Welcome to City Minutes, where we discuss new research that helps us understand the UK's largest cities and towns and policy ideas to improve their economic performance. I'm your host, Andrew Carter, from the Think Tank Centre for Cities. Enjoy the episode. Welcome to this episode of City Minutes. Today, I'm joined by my colleague, Rob Johnson, to talk about our latest report, which Rob has co-written with our colleague, Oscar Selby, looking at the return to office trends across a group of global cities. The report is called Return to the Office, How London Compares to Other Global Cities and Why This Matters. So Rob, let's start with um, the relevance. Why have we done this report and why now? Sure. So it's easy for some of us to forget that when the pandemic hit in 2020, that was a seismic shock to sort of the way uh, the world works. And we saw a lot of predictions then from sort of zero office attendance. You know, is this the end of the office? Is the office dead? Now, in 2024, the answer to that is clearly no. And you just need to walk around uh, the city of London at 9 a.m. on a weekday to see that. But on the other hand, office work in city centres has definitely changed since the pandemic. And that change has happened around the world. Now, at Centre for Cities, uh, we're interested in the forces that shape cities that bring high productivity, knowledge intensive firms into city centres. And so naturally, we were pretty sceptical about these uh, end of the office pr- predictions, but there was very little data uh, to support either way. So that prompted us last year to uh, do a report on uh, office working in central London. So we surveyed central London office workers and we found that people were coming in just under half half the week uh, in the office and sort of three quarters of them were mandated to do so. So that gave us a nice snapshot, a nice baseline as to what office working was like in 2023. But we need to remember that at that time, the last COVID restrictions had only ended just over a year before. This year, there's been more time for the dust to settle. And so from this baseline, we want to see how the return to the office has continued. Also, what's driving it and what we might Uh, be able to expect in the future. And we want to put London in the international context. So is what London is experiencing, is it similar to other global cities or does it look a bit different? Brilliant. So that's why we've done it. So let's let's just turn now to what we did and how we went about finding out what the trends were in the group of cities, but start off by actually listing out the cities that we looked at, and then we can get into, say a little bit about the method and the approach that we adopted and the data that we we gathered. Great. So we ran another survey on uh, workers and we broadened the scope out to five other comparator cities. So these are Paris, New York, Singapore, Sydney, and Toronto. And we did it in London again. And these are big global cities that are full of high productivity, knowledge intensive firms and provide a kind of global picture uh, of what office working is like in large productive cities. So that, that provides the overall context. We also had another innovation on the survey that we did in that we looked directly at decision makers as well. So these are the managers, the directors of these firms who might be setting the rules of um, office working And it gives us the other side. There had been too much focus on uh, worker preferences, worker views on uh, office working before. So we wanted to sort of get a balance there. So those are the innovations that gave us a mass of data. And we analyzed that and then pulled out the themes and comparisons from there. Right. And our acute listeners, so just to be completely certain, we're looking at the central locations, i.e. the central business districts of those cities themselves. And we're only really interested in workers that are going into offices rather than workers in general that may be working in those central London locations or the source central city locations. Yeah. So that's why we did it and what we did and how we went about the da- gathering the data. Let's look at the headline findings. So start to list out some of the headline findings that we found. Sure. So let, let's start with, you know, what does the return to the office look like and how does London compare to these other cities? So the return to the office has continued in London. This year, uh, London workers are in, on average, 2.7 days per week, and that's up from 2.2 days from last year. So this return has continued. And another finding is that fully remote working 
is now pretty much back to what it was at pre-pandemic levels. So this again sort of flies in the face of this end of the office prediction. We've kind of settled back to what was fairly normal pre-pandemic after a little rise in the intervening years. But let's put that in the international context. And actually here we find that in terms of average days spent in the office, London is pretty much near the bottom of the pack. So it's just a a little bit higher than Toronto, also 2.7 days, but well behind Paris, 3.5 days in the office, and New York, 3.1, where actually there was a lot of concern sort of post-pandemic that Manhattan would sort of turn into a bit of a ghost town. And we see similar uh, things in Sydney and Singapore around three days. So we dug a bit deeper here. We wanted to understand, you know, why does London stick out here? And there were three main sort of differentiators here. Working patterns. So in London, a quarter of workers come into the office just one or two days. That That's the most of any uh, city. So you've got quite a lot of workers who are quite tenuously linked to their offices. London's offices on a Friday are the emptiest of all the cities we saw. And we see the sharpest drop from uh, the midweek average. And London's midweek average is relatively low. And finally, and this was an interesting one, that in London, younger workers are actually coming in to the office the most. So if you're in your early slash mid 20s, you're in roughly three days a week, but over 35s, that's down to 2.5 days. And this is a kind of uh, pattern that's unique to London. So it's clear that a return to the office has happened and it's happened in all of these cities, but uh, we, we looked into a bit as to why this was the case. So on the one hand, mandates have been creeping up over the time. So London's uh, most popular number of mandated days has shifted from two to three days over the past year. And almost all employers in a London city centre have some sort of mandate. But in the international context, London has the lowest mandates of all cities that looked at. But it's not just mandates. It's actually that workers themselves see the benefits coming into the office. So we asked workers, even if you had no mandates, what, what would your office working patterns be? And pretty much across all cities, they said they'd come in around two days in the office. So the the kind of pandemic patterns of fully remote working, that seems more like a blip rather than a kind of pure expression of what workers wanted to do in terms of their working patterns. And this is because 95% of workers in all cities see some benefits to being in the office. Most cited are things like collaboration with colleagues and building relationships with them. And this was aligned with their employers as well. So then, you know, why haven't we seen a full return to pre-pandemic levels? That's just because workers and employers see benefits to working from home too. So uh, things like flexibility on the worker side, uh, things like operating costs on the employer side. So you've got this balance of forces. You've got employers pushing people back into the office. You've got the pull of the office felt by workers, but then you've got this com- these competing benefits uh, from working from home. So then we wanted to look to the future and sort of say, is what we're seeing today, is that close to some sort of new normal of office working or are there further changes to be had? So on, on the one hand, there are some signs that maybe we are close to some sort of new normal. So there's clearly been a slowdown in the return to the office. From zero around 2020, it's gone up to 2.2 days, 2023, but then just 2.7 over the past year. And TFL data on morning rush hour tap outs backs this up. And actually, when you ask employers, about 90% of them probably or in current attitudes going to stick with their mandates. And most of them, if they if you ask them to look to the future, they think what we're seeing today is likely what's going to be sticking around sort of two thirds in London and similar levels in other cities. But from our, our survey responses, we think that things can shift and there are kind of three main aspects that suggest this. First of all, 10% of employers are going to increase mandates no matter what. So, you know, that's likely to resolve in the near future. Um, there's also the fact that current mandates seem to be pretty loosely enforced across all cities. So it's only Paris that workers come in at least as much as they are mandated to on average. So there's a lot of room for maneuver there. And then there's also, it seems that employers seem to be overly worried about workers quitting in the face of rising mandates. So in London, 37% of employers said they wouldn't raise mandates because they were worried about start quitting, but actually only 9% of workers said they would do so in the face of rising mandates. So we did we did a bit of uh, back of the envelope modeling here saying, you know, what if these mismatches between attitudes and behavior, what if they were to resolve? 
that might suggest somewhere in the near future, London could be in the office about three days if people came in much of their mandate said, and you know these other changes happen. But this would put them about half a day behind every other city. So there was a real clear difference between London and the rest of the pack here. Other cities would be much closer to their pre-pandemic levels. But this is to say that these trajectories, they're not ordained. We don't have a crystal ball about this. And its we've clearly seen that attitudes could shift and they could shift again. So there's a nice little contradiction we found uh, in the surveys where if you ask employers, employees, looking at the short-term productivity benefits of home working, a lot of them don't see many negatives. They're pretty relaxed about that. But if, if you ask them about the long-term, there are concerns that uh, workers staying at home more will develop fewer skills and maybe have impacts on promotion and pay. Now that's directly related to productivity. Skills directly impact productivity and promotion and pay are markers of increased productivity. So these attitudes could shift. Great sort of summary of, of the headline findings. Obviously lots more analysis and detail in the report. Let, let's finally turn to sort of the implications of the, the findings. So I suppose there's a, there's a set of implications from the findings for policy and practice, what we do about it, how we think about it. And then I suppose there's a question related to that, which is what needs to change as a result of the findings and the implications. So just walk us through uh, some of the headline implications and then uh, some of the suggestions about what needs to change. Yeah, so I'll start with the implications of what we found, and that will inform sort of what we suggest should happen uh, going further on. So London's trajectory seems to stand out against all the other cities in terms of its slower return to the office. Why does this matter? So we touched on it a bit at the start, but we need to understand why high productivity, knowledge intensive businesses tend to cluster in city centers. So this is generally because uh, something economists call knowledge spillover. So you have a dense environment of firms are locating in the same place that increases interactions between firms and between workers in those firms, and you get a greater exchange of knowledge. So if you think about it just in one office, if more people are, are coming into that office, you're getting more interactions uh, between colleagues and meetings, etc. But also, if you think in aggregate, if more people are coming into the office in lots of firms in the same place, you're getting these interactions across firms. So uh, meetings with other firms or even just sort of chance encounters in streets or pubs. And for the kinds of firms that gather in these city centres, the ones that use knowledge uh, the most, this can in improve their productivity and therefore the productivity of the city centre and the city as a whole. So if London is on this slower trajectory than other cities, it could suggest that its productivity performance could fall behind these other cities. And the other thing to highlight here is the age difference that seems unique to London. Younger workers coming in more, older workers coming in less. This could amplify sort of this effect. So the knowledge spillovers I talk about, these tend to flow downhill. And what I mean by that is that a lot of the learning is coming from these senior employees and going to their uh, younger workers based on their experience and, and their skills. So if you have this phenomenon of maybe the desks being full, but the manager's offices being empty on a typical weekday, then London's productivity hit could be uh, amplified here. And you might be worried about its uh, global competitiveness sliding against these other cities. So those are the implications. And this informed basically what we think should happen. So I think we at Centre for Cities think that a good aim for the Mayor of London City, Khan, is to set London's return to the office on a similar trajectory as these other global cities, to not lose out on these productivity benefits. And so that leads to kind of three main steps that can help to improve that. So first, we think there should be a call for evidence. So government needs to sort of gather evidence, gather better evidence on the productivity impacts of hybrid working. Now, there, there's a smattering of kind of academic research on this, but actually the evidence is pretty thin on the ground and there needs to be a coordinated effort to do this. And this also needs to happen within businesses as well. Businesses need to understand, you know, what are their current working patterns? How is that impacting their overall productivity? As a helper to this, the mayor um, could have set up what we, we're calling a productivity advisory council. So I've seen Rachel Reeves kind of assemble her Council of Economic Advisors recently. The mayor should do something similar, trying to understand uh, what are the productivity implications of hybrid working in central London. Now, the second point is that workers just need to access their city centre offices and they need to be able to access it in cheaper, easier and quicker ways. So this turns to the commute. 
And this is because, particularly in London, travel costs were the top cited reason uh, for people working from home. That, that was highest across all cities. So there's a clear barrier there that needs to be tackled, particularly in London. So we suggest that TfL reinstates its off-peak Fridays trial that happened earlier this year. Now, the original one seems to have been hampered by a kind of a lack of awareness, and it was quite short term. So we think this should be reinstated. There should be a consolidated campaign before, during trial to increase this awareness, and it should happen over the longer term. And then we can be more clear about the trade-off between the costs of the, the policy versus the potential benefits in terms of travel for office working. Now, we think that commuter transport investment should be continued in the capital, and this should sort of be open to a future shifts in commuting behavior. So there may have been a tendency to cite kind of permanent changes in the level of commuting immediately post-pandemic. We think, you know, the, the nature, the pattern of commuting might change, but there should be accounting for these future shifts. And so one aspect of this might be with the statement of Great British Railways, maybe there should be a review for um, sort of rail ticketing and fares to kind of capture the different style of commuting that has happened post-pandemic. And the other key thing on commuting is that workers simply not liking being in the office are a very small uh, minority. So if you're a firm and maybe you've got a budget for perks, uh, being in the office, say sort of free meals or revamps of offices, you might want to consider whether that money might be better spent tackling sort of travel costs instead. What our data suggests is that is a far bigger barrier to people coming in the office. And finally, there needs to be a change in attitudes. So the mayor can lead on this. There can be a, a coordinated campaign with local businesses, business groups. We saw a similar one post-pandemic to get footfall back in the centre of London. So that was called Let's Do London. So something similar to that. And there are potential learnings from cities that have had more successful returns to the offices so far, such as Paris and New York. And on the firm level, firms need to consider mandates as a tool to get people in the office. What our data suggests is workers would accept higher mandates. And there's also a balance of, you know, do you enforce your existing mandates uh, more closely? And finally, we think that business leaders, directors, they should lead by example. So senior staff need to set the standard for office working and that will have implications for the development of their less senior colleagues. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much, Rob. A great sort of summary of the report. I so said the report um, is called Return to the Office, How London Compares to Other Global Cities and Why This Matters. You can find it on our website, centreforcities.org, along with other associate materials, other blogs by Rob and Oscar and colleagues looking at different aspects of the report and the implications for it, there's also two other reports, I suppose, which form part of a series that we've looked at in relation to London. You can find them as well. One looks at London's productivity challenges, particularly since the great financial crisis. And as Rob said, uh, our return to the office office politics from last year was our first snapshot as to where London was on the return to work journey. Both of those are also available on our website. But for now, thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of City Minutes brought to you by the Centre for Cities. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Podbean by searching Centre for Cities. Please rate and subscribe if you like what you heard. Centre for Cities is an independent think tank dedicated to improving the economies of UK's largest cities and towns. You can follow the centre on Twitter at Centre for Cities, all one word, or on LinkedIn for the latest on what the centre is up to. To hear all about our latest reports and briefings and upcoming events, sign up to our fortnightly newsletter via our website, centreforcities.org. If you'd like to get in touch, do tweet us or send an email to info at centreforcities.org.